Well, folks, it's official. The Federal Reserve, according to Zero Hedge, is now racist, and cutting interest rates is racist. We've got to break this down and understand why the heck this is being said and what happened with those Fed FOMC minute meeting notes this morning. Let's discuss those. I did try to go live. Couldn't do that, though, because there's some kind of going live glitch. So sorry about that. Let's give you a recap, though, after the fact. So first of all, Mr. Goolsby spoke at a conference and did suggest that rising black unemployment is now a concern. And this comes after we got hot CPI data. And this is leading a lot of people to go, wait, where did all of a sudden that come from? Why is the Federal Reserve all of a sudden wanting to no longer be data dependent on inflation and now start looking at other reasons to potentially cut? Why is this happening? Well, in today's minutes, the Federal Reserve may have actually signaled exactly what the problem is. But first, let's analyze Mr. Goolsby's underlying complaint that rising black unemployment is becoming a problem. Let's take a peek here. This is a chart of seasonally adjusted black employment or unemployment, I should say. And you can see a slight move up here on the right, though I will say it doesn't seem to be anything more than these sort of normal jumps that we could get either here or here or here or here or here. It doesn't seem to be anything more than that at this point. So it is interesting that on a day that you get hot CPI, you get a Fed board member suggest, you know what? Even though CPI is coming in hot, we still have to cut because black unemployment is going up. Interesting. Now, Goolsby is one of the more dovish individuals at the Fed, but then what I wanted to do is compare this to what's happening with other races like white, Asian, and Hispanic. And you will notice that in those categories, you are seeing the unemployment rate move down where black is moving up. So that could, in fairness, amplify what Goolsby is saying here. You can see the last two reports here are up on black uh, and down or flat on the others, the others being white, Asian, and Hispanic. But is that a reason to delay rate cuts or not and... What is the Fed really actually concerned about? Well, I think the minutes today gave us a little bit of a look and maybe what the Federal Reserve is truly concerned about. And they're almost just looking for an excuse as to how can we keep justifying that we need to cut rates? Now, it's interesting because the bond market doesn't think the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates anytime soon. We've got the 10-year Treasury sitting at 5.55, and now we're pricing out rate cuts all the way out to November. We're barely pricing in one and a half rate cuts this year. Barclays reduced their rate cut expectations. A lot of banks are expected to follow suit today and over the next few days. But take a look at this. This is directly from the minutes, and this is the first time I've actually started to see this sort of intensity of delinquency talk. Maybe to really set a baseline, let's actually go to the last uh, FOMC minute set, and we'll start at the last one, and we'll just search for delinquencies. So they talk about how the delinquencies on conventional mortgages remained low, while delinquency rates on credit cards and auto loans rose in the third quarter to levels notably above those before the pandemic. So we did see some deterioration slightly, but remained broadly solid is the phraseology they're using here. They also say aggregate delinquencies of commercial mortgage-backed securities uh, continued to be elevated in November. And in January, they indicated that credit quality was expected to deteriorate somewhat. So none of that seemed very exigent or concerning. They did talk about some declines in commercial real estate prices, and uh, they did indicate notable leverage in the financial sector. That was the last minute set. Well, how does their sort of verbatim make us feel this time? Take a look at this. Credit quality for large firms and home mortgage brokers remained solid, but deteriorated further in sectors such as commercial real estate and credit cards. The trailing six month default rate on corporate borrowers bonds and loans remained low. In contrast, credit rating downgrades outpaced upgrades for leveraged loans. So in other words, expensive, more likely to default loans. Those loan downgrades uh, exceeded 
expectations in both January and February and credit quality for smaller businesses has declined. So we are seeing that weakness, that debt bubble issue, too much debt, fees are too high. This morning on our course member live stream, we analyzed Whirlpool. And one of the things we noticed with Whirlpool is they're spending over $300 million on interest. And quite frankly, their cash flow, free cash flow, isn't that great. Their balance sheet doesn't look that good. They don't even have enough current assets to cover their current liabilities and they're borrowing just to pay their 6% dividend. I see that dividend getting slashed. And I didn't when I saw them brag about their dividend in the earnings call. But when I actually looked at the balance sheet, I think they're on an unsustainable path, especially with higher interest rates. And I think the Federal Reserve is realizing, crap, soon we're going to start probably seeing some real debt defaults picking up. And it's starting to hit households too. Look at this. Mortgage delinquency rates for commercial and VA loans were largely unchanged, but delinquency rates on FHA loans picked up slightly. So we're starting to see a pickup in FHA loan delinquencies. Interesting, because we thought there was so much equity in the single family market. Why would we see delinquencies here? So we're seeing a pickup on FHA. Credit card delinquency rates increased a bit further and stood above levels just before the pandemic. The upward trend in auto delinquency rates did stabilize, so that's good. But delinquency rates for non-farm, non-residential loans at banks increased to levels we have not seen since late 2014. Now, that's really interesting because now what we're getting is the Fed saying, whoa, we're starting to compare delinquency rates now to the past. And for non-farm, non-residential, so basically just sort of your consumer loans, your personal loans, we're starting to see uh, the highest level of delinquencies that we have not seen since 2014 at all banks. That's not great. That is a high level of delinquencies, and we don't want to be at those sort of levels. This means that not only are we uh, higher uh, than our pre-pandemic levels, but we're really running up to maybe beginning of 2007 style levels. I'll show you this on a chart so you can see this a little bit more visually. This is what they're referring to, delinquency rate on consumer loans at all commercial banks. You can see we've passed our pre-pandemic high here of 2.47%, now at 262. We're basically going straight up like a rocket ship over here. And we've seen that right before the recession, we were sitting just over 3%, which we're getting closer to at about 262 right now. Uh, and when they say the highest level since 2014, really they should be referring to late 2013. But the closer we get to the recession, the more we're making comparisons by going up this sort of ladder over here. And it's just not the ladder we really want to climb up. Now, we're going back to here, we can see Delinquency rates for commercial mortgage-backed securities continue to increase in January and February. And get this, folks, delinquency rates would have been higher had many borrowers with loans maturing last year not received extensions. The deterioration of commercial real estate credit quality sparked investor concerns about the health of a few small U.S. and foreign banks over the intermediate period. So it seems like the Federal Reserve is starting to get concerned about aspects outside of just inflation in terms of maybe why they need to cut this year. However, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to feel happy about that or scared by that because the reality is if the Federal Reserve feels like they're being forced to cut because we're seeing rising delinquencies and rising unemployment in at least a certain segment, at least in this case, a certain race, uh, then we potentially are cutting not because inflation is solved, but because we have to. And see, those are the most scary kind of rate cuts to get. Rate cuts because things are normalizing are good. That's okay. Rate cuts because crap, things are deteriorating. Those are bad. Those lead to corrections, crashes, and recessions. And I'm not saying that the rate cuts are causing the recessions. They're usually a response to things that are causing a recession, and they're an early indicator that we're heading into a recession. So these are some of the early little smoldering fires that I'm getting out of the Fed's minutes here that are starting to smolder a little warmer and warmer. And again, this ghoul speak comment about basically saying, yeah, well, I guess that is a little higher. 
but black unemployment is rising. When I first heard that, I'm like, where did that come from? That It came out of nowhere. Now, I get it. Then I looked up the data, and I'm like, okay, okay, I, I, I see it. But what happened to the data dependency on inflation? We, we should be, I mean, the Fed has clearly a debate about uh, that dependency on inflation. Uh, they, uh, they mentioned here in the notes that some members uh, argued that we should not dismiss the recent inflation reports as aberrations. In other words, uh, don't just like discount uh, the problems that we're having with this higher level of inflation uh, in the Jan, Feb, and March reports. Instead, uh, you should actually be concerned by them. And in that case, maybe we just need to stay at a higher rate for a while. Larry Summers thinks there's a 10 to 15% chance of actually raising rates. Others at the Fed are saying, ah, oh, it's just seasonality. That's in the minutes. But again, these other sort of where there's smoke, there's fire concerns. I think these are things that we really want to start paying attention to a little bit more to say, okay, are we going to start cutting because we have to rather than we get to? And again, cutting because we have to is much worse than cutting because we get to. So where does this leave us now? Well, obviously, waiting for more updates uh, from the Federal Reserve, waiting for more clarity from uh, various different board members, and our PPI report tomorrow morning. I'll cover that live at 5.30 in the morning, California time. And then, of course, we'll be covering j on May 1st. But in the meantime, the little smolderings over here, they're becoming a little more clear. Oh, one more thing. Remember last uh, time, maybe you don't, but the last time we talked about how foreign headline inflation was actually expected to contribute to a, a decline in inflation out here. This is called exported deflation. You could actually see that right, uh, oops, wrong button. You could see that right here. This is the last FOMC minute set. Foreign headline inflation continued to fall. However, the pace of decline had varied. Okay, that's what they said last time. Well, this time when I search for foreign inflation, what do they say? Foreign inflation picked up early in the year as downward pressure from previous energy price declines waned. Great. Actually, not great. <laughs> this means we're actually now exporting less deflation to America, which is not good. Somebody this morning mentioned, oh, well, disinflation is still happening. Not really, <laughs> because we actually just moved up in month-over-month -month inflation figures. And when you move up, you're not actually disinflating. You're stabilizing, or if anything, you're just inflating. Like, let's just say it, you're inflating more. <laughs> so uh, some concerns here about what's going on, what the Federal Reserve is going to do. These are some of my takeaways here. As I'm recording this now, I am noting that the uh, inverted yield curve, that 210, is getting more inverted. Uh, not great. We're back at the most inverted levels that we've been in, I want to say, March 28th, we were a little lower, and then uh, early March, we were a little lower. So we're kind of in the hole this year. We're really at the lowest point that we have been in terms of inversion. Lowest point was about 45 basis points. We're down at 41 right now. But in January, we were only 18 basis points inverted. So in other words, we're, we're getting more inverted again which would be another potential signal that you know, the recession is still isn't solved. That might still be ahead of us. We might still near, need that as sort of a clearing system. And maybe that'll be what ends up killing inflation once and for all, which obviously we don't want a recession, but uh, it is a concern. So anyway, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Why not advertise these things that you told us here? I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, licensed real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is not personalized advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show shall not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purposes of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services we may benefit from. I also personally operate an actively managed ETF. I may personally hold or otherwise hold law 
long or short positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuer other than Hausack, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Make sure if you're considering investing in Hausack to always read the PPM at Hausack.com.